Uh, good morning. A uh, special thanks to Betty and the organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, Evergreen Fedge meeting today. Before starting, I would like to tell you a short story. Uh, as president of Fage Espoir, uh, my organization, I've been contacted last July by a 76 years old patient, a woman suffering from uh, severe bronchitis. And she was really uh, in a severe status with a multi-resistant uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection, lung infection, difficulty for breathing, difficulty for moving. Uh, she was really uh, uh, decreasing her status. So she called me to, to get phages because uh, his uh, pneumologist couldn't do anything more for her. And so I made uh, an official, a very official request to the National Security Agency for Drugs in France with a very complete file and uh, with a fair residence, uh, we selected appropriate phages. Uh, we gave all information regarding the treatment we wanted to do, the surveillance we wanted to do, and the way we are going to, to monitor this treatment. And the first answer has been negative. So I made the first uh, request in July. I got the first response in August. So I made a second request, and we had a negative and definitive negative answer in last December. The patient died in January, uh, clearly because of his uh, pulmonary status and because of his evolving, of a, of a evolving uh, lung infection. So just to say, because sometimes facts are not sufficient, are not enough, to convince political decision. That's why I intitulate my talk, and particularly for patients with therapeutic dead end, from science to politics. So I would like to talk about three endpoints. First, why I think today we need clearly phage therapy for infected patients with therapeutic dead end. No, sorry. why we need to understand what is called now regulatory science, and why some patient organization can be important in this fight. We all face a difficult context. Very clearly, it has already been said, but just we have an increasing and worldwide bacterial resistance to antibiotics, and an almost dry pipeline of new antibiotics by, from Big Pharma. So these are two major risk factors for an increasing number of patients with therapeutic dead end now and in the following years. But this also raises many medical, ethical, social, and legal unresolved issues. And I think that it's also a responsibility to think about it. We have also to face many stakes first how to take political decision making under scientific uncertainties, to realize that today there is a mismatch between research and development on phage therapy and patient prognosis timeframes. For you, working in a lab, six months is a short time. For some patients with vital or functional prognosis, six months is sometimes not enough to survive. So we just have to take into consideration. Also, today we can observe some inequity because of regulatory, physical, financial reason in the current access to phage therapy. And let's say that more philosophically, we can just ask ourselves if phages are an industry, an industry product or a common good. But frankly, today, I would just focus on these two points. So what is regulatory science? It's how science can make prediction on the basis of uncertainties and how it is confronted to policymaker decision. And you can see that it's particularly true for biotechnology and phages clearly in this area. And finally, between values and certainty, the area of consensus is quite small. And regarding the area that interests us, that means antibiotic resistance and phage issue, 
we are not in a consensus area. We are in a zone of complexity. Finally, just nearby the chaos zone. So, regulatory science is the relationship, the confrontation between facts, it is a matter of science and values. And so, uh, we have to understand that many external and extra scientific constraints are at stake. And also that the decisions that have to be taken at governmental, at policymaker level, are far-reaching decisions involving both public health but also economic costs. They are not easy decisions. Issue of perception is also very important. You are treating people with virus. With virus. For you, it's just obvious. But I can guess that for many people, it's not so obvious. And also, sociological studies bring us the knowledge that what for you is objective criteria is not so objective. That depending on your institutional affiliation, your cultural or societal values, the production of scientific evidence can be significantly affected. So that's why to bring and to make a bridge between science, politics, patients, we set up this organization in July uh, 2009 with two main objectives. First, to promote fundamental and clinical research on phages. Second, to advocate toward all stakeholders involved in political decision making. And third, very important, to support patients for a properly surrounded ethical and medical access to phage therapy. And also, associations like us can make and can create a significant leverage effect. Just remember, 30 years ago, with AIDS, patients' association clearly mobilized the scientific community, the political decision maker for getting drugs. More recently, cystic fibrosis patients mobilize also very strongly. So, just a few words on what we have done. We have now 200 registered members and everybody is working on a voluntary basis. We have some scientific collaboration and publication with some expert teams, and we organize in France some symposium on phage therapy. We participate, as today, to conferences, national or international. We are making a strong work of advocacy and sensitization to phage therapy issue to our many stakeholders, policymakers, physicians, sanitary authority, civil society. We also try to get a media mobilization with articles in newspaper, interview in TV broadcast, articles in information website, and we use all these social networks. And we work also with patients for real. We are doing psychological support to people that contact us. We are trying to channel them to uh, places where you can do today uh, face therapy, and there are not so many places, Georgia, but also Poland, and also some places in the United States, but from France it's a little bit far. We are working on doing a national registry uh, for patients treated by, with phages, and I think this uh, national registry should be done at the European level to be really effective. And we plan to open very soon a dedicated medical consultation for patients that contacted us and to see if they are really in therapeutic dead end. Very rapidly, some data on these patients that are potentially in therapeutic dead end. Since one year, we got 46 patients, not so old, 32% with multiple bacteria, majority of them with previous multiple uh, antibiotic therapies and surgical intervention for patients with osteoarticular problems. With, you can see, respiratory, cutaneous, articular origin are uh, uh, the main, uh, main causes. In terms of uh, bacterial identification, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Escherichia coli are predominant. 30% of patients that contact us uh, have respiratory problems. So I think that the respiratory issue is a major one. But also diabetes, cancer, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. And half of the patients uh, 
uh, suffer from nosocomial infection, but that means that half of the patients did not contract their infection at hospital set, in hospital setting. So we are not facing uh, an hospital problem. It's really a community also problem. And 100% of, of these patients have the perception of therapeutic dead end. And 41% are to withdraw their professional activity. So you can just imagine economic and psychosocial consequences. So we clearly see the tip of the iceberg. We identify some patients. We have some probably many, many patients unidentified. And uh, very rapidly, I would say that we need RCTs to establish the proof of efficacy of edge therapy. Some are starting, but today we just have uh, case studies and observational studies. But to my point of view, and it can be, uh, uh, we can debate about it, I think in terms of tolerance and safety, if we use the tools that we are talking about since four days, uh, tolerance can be acceptable. So the risk benefit is clearly in favor of using phage therapy in patients with therapeutic dead end. So, in terms of take-off messages, regulatory science is a complex and nonlinear process evolving in a gray area. Moving from science to politics is a transitional process, and for that we need to understand all factors at stake, and many factors are not scientific or medical. This can, is a, this can uh, allow to have better adapted and more comprehensive strategy for introducing phage therapy, and particularly in therapeutic dead end patients. That now we have really to push for using phage therapy in these patients, and uh, we can discuss about the role of the phage community for this. And that organizations like Phage Espoir, and I hope that some other will, uh, uh, will be present, are important because of the network, because of the patient support, because of the capacity of leverage effect that we can have at political level. And uh, if patients need scientists and physicians and industry, I want also you to remember that scientists, physicians and industry need patients uh, for this fellowship. I would just want to first thank you for your attention, to thank my board uh, that helped very well, to thank all volunteers and all patients and people that support us. And you can join us and find us uh, on the website, by mail, and on the Facebook page. I thank you very much. Do you have questions? Yeah. I don't have any questions. I only want ah. to congratulate you Sorry. on your rainy day no, no, no. I think it's absolutely critical, uh, your action. Uh, as I mentioned to you unofficially many times, I remember times in Poland when I was a medical student, the beginning and the rise of kidney transplantation. At that time, my mentor, a leading Polish scientist and clinician, who had a very good collaboration with the US, or with the leading American nephrologist of the time, Bricker from St. Louis, he wanted to perform first kidney transplant. And he sought support from another leading Polish scientist who represented basic science in immunology. And he went to him asking for help for the establishment of tissue and uh, immunological monitoring lab. And he gave him advice, I mean the scientist, the basic scientist told him, I advise you stay away from this business because everybody knows that allograft has to be rejected in principle. It's a foreign tissue and everybody, medical mm -hmm. students know that of course it needs to be rejected. Of course he didn't follow that advice, thanks to God. <laughs> And when I look back, I believe that uh, uh, brave, bright actions are very important at this level of, uh, of age development on, uh, on international arena. And, and I would like to conclude what I have already said to be. I congratulate you, and I wish you luck in your actions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I think there was a question. Oh, I just wanted to acknowledge that the essence of
of what you're asking here and proposing, um, I mean, you're, you're acknowledging that where we're at is we want to go ahead with using all the various media approaches that we have in all of our countries. And we were discussing this the other day that if we broadcast out what we know on these small case-by-case -case patients, which is quite possible, and especially, like you said, if people that are in a terminal situation, then uh, various regulatory agencies allow you to do more experimental things. Um, basically, it's experimental. So I just want to acknowledge that I think you're, you're addressing a key question of how, at what point do you kind of let out the information into the general, all the various um, tools of communication that the population has, and at what point do you prevent them to not want that because we want to develop our research base first. It's just this, it's an unanswered question. You know, that in mm. history, sometimes you go forward and get put down, and sometimes you go forward and it takes mm. off. I just want to acknowledge that uh, you're addressing something very key. Yeah. I think we really need a multi-track approach. We need basic research, we need SETs, but we need also to care about people because the first result of SETs won't be before two or three years being optimist. So during this time, what are we doing? Now, what I read is that we are very strong to make genomic sequencing. We are very strong, very uh, accurate on it. Uh, okay, maybe should we focus on phages that have been already used in therapeutic and you have the Polish experience, you have the Georgian experience, which are massive. It will be a really a big mistake to ignore it because uh, the methodology of how they treated patients was not exactly the one that is asked by your uh, regulatory authorities. They have a really a huge experience and we need to use it. And they already use phages. Okay, well, could not we concentrate some efforts, not all, but some efforts to sequence these therapeutic phages as a priority because you have patients. You have patients and I think uh, to have fundamental research is as important to care about patients. But maybe there is some disbalance today and we have to reestablish it. And to regarding mediatization, uh, it has to be used cautiously. It's not to have an article every day in newspaper. It's just to report some clinical situation that are really not acceptable and as a physician, I cannot accept it because there was a way to treat patients. You have people dying. What do you have to lose? So now the risk-benefit ratio is clearly in favor of it. And as a phage community, we maybe have to push it a little bit more voicely. And this is clearly my message, but uh, I understand also that that can be polemic and that uh, uh, there can be uh, different voices on it. Yeah, I think one thing you could do is to ride the wave of the public starting to understand that there are beneficial microbes. That is not being a case in people's minds. They've always assumed that they were all bad. And so here's just another example where you could use the persuasion theory to persuade people that there are good viruses before you do anything else. Mm. So once you convince people of that, then I think the rest can you decide to build the rest of the case. So yeah. I think that's a message to start with. Yeah, I agree. Does France fall under the Declaration of Helsinki? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's why, a, why couldn't you uh, because that? Be, because because Declaration of Helsinki is not a law, is not a law, <laughs> and that uh, when you're a physician, when you're, com of course, we can use it, but uh, it's a little bit more efficient uh, to move things uh, at the regulatory level and within uh, with a community beyond you that when you're just a single physician think okay I'm applying a key principles and I'm going to treat patients some some already did but you don't have any leverage effects so we need to associate patients for that because they are the first concern on this issue but you're right to underline that I think in principle are also a way for treating patients. But unfortunately, 
it doesn't bring the necessary leverage effect for treating dozens and dozens of thousands of patients that are concerned.